the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, Salam alaikum to everyone. Uh, you know, you saw me talking to um, Wissam during your speech. I apologize, because it was a great speech, by the way. But that's just because I have a lot of love for Wissam, uh, who is a very close brother, as well as Norman. But I think this is the first time we actually rocked it together, which is incredible. And, and it, it's wonderful to see both of these incredibly articulate, intelligent uh, young men um, doing it, you know. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase their dunya, it, inshallah, and this life and the next. Secondly, I just came from Boston, so I'm going to be finishing before 8. My talk will finish before 8 o'clock. That's for sure. And those of you from Philly, don't even give me salam today. All right? Um, I actually am from Oklahoma, uh, USA. Yes. And I became Muslim in 1992. And I was talking to Wissam about, really, honestly, I think the topic is not given enough time. You didn't take the time you needed, actually, um, to talk about three heavyweights, you know, three incredible prophets in 15 minutes. And I think also there'll be a little bit of information overload. But one thing that did initially surprise me about Islam at the age of 18, my first imam was Rakim. And through that, being directed towards getting a copy of the Qur'an and thinking that when I read the Qur'an, it was going to be almost like a diatribe against Christ. And that's really, that's something I, I was so scared, I put the Qur'an in the restroom. Because I was worried that if my mother found the Qur'an, I would be like Gulab Jaman or something. Like, <laughs> she would take me out. So actually in Oklahoma, it was Oklahoma, right? I kept the Qur'an in the restroom, and I opened the Qur'an for the first time, and I found a chapter called Mary, the 19th chapter of the Qur'an. And I was expecting, again, to be, you know, kind of a diatribe against Christ, his family, Christians, Jews, you name it. But, in fact, it was really one of the most beautiful chapters in the Qur'an that when I read it to my mother, who to this day is a non-Muslim, goes to church every Sunday and Wednesday, when I read the first 40 verses of Surah Maryam to her in English, she began to cry. And she said, this is from God. So that really sparked my interest, and that ultimately kind of led me to become Muslim. Now, the topic that we're giving is about, given about the prophets, and the, the, the backdrop of this convention is about Sharia. And in this attempt to Shararize America, right, we need to become educated and literate as Muslims in speaking about Sharia. And when we're given this opportunity to talk about the prophets, three of the greatest prophets. What is their relationship to Sharia? This attempt to Shararize America. Number one, we believe that all of the prophets from Adam to Muhammad, peace be upon them, had the same creed. Al-Anbiya ikhwa wa dinuhum wahid. The hadith in Bukhari says that the prophets were brothers, the fundamentals of their creed were the same. Secondly, we believe that as a source of Sharia, all of the prophets agreed on that source. Secondly, we agree that they all agreed upon the maqasid of Sharia, the objectives of Sharia. And this is a discussion that we need to be having here at this conference because the topic is about Sharia and people are Shariaized. I'm from Oklahoma. It was the first state to try to attempt to pass the anti-Sharia bill. This creeping Sharia, it's like a TLC song. And I creep, right? You're creeping with Sharia. So how do you respond to that in light of three of the most important historical figures for all of us is that we believe that they brought five major objectives that can be touched on, that make up the core of Sharia. And you learn this, by the way, in the fourth year in Azhar in Kulit al-Sharia, and you practice it in two years in Dar Ifta as someone who's training. Number one, we believe that the Sharia came to preserve faith, to look after faith. And that's why we believe, And that's why we believe that Christ was not crucified or killed. He was protected. Because if your point man dies, that means that there's a weakness in your call. 
Secondly, we believe that they came to preserve the intellect. The intellect of the people. That's why he said, I came to teach you, Isa. And our Prophet Muhammad says, ilma. And the only thing that a Muslim is asked to ask of an increase for in Quran, as mentioned by Imam Ibn Hajr, is an increase in knowledge. Number three is the preservation of life. People should not be killed. And that's why in all three of these incredible prophets' messages we have, basically from the Ten Commandments, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا نَفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ Thou shalt not kill. The fourth is the preservation of lineage and family. And that's why, you know, try it before you buy it doesn't work. You have to marry it if you like it. If you like it, put a ring on it. Right? And we know who said that. And don't ask me how I know. It's a long story. I got kids, man. So if you like it, put a ring on it. And vice versa, sis, if you like it, put a ring on it. According to the Malikis, it's fine. And that's why we find the mother of Christ saying, Ya mittu qabla hadha wa kuntu nasyan mansiya. In the 19th chapter of the Quran, when Mary was apprised of the fact that when she goes back to her people with this child, they may accuse her of fornication. And she said, I would rather die than be accused of that. Her sense of haya, her sense of dignity, her sense of iffa, and let me translate that and I apologize, her sense of fidelity and integrity was such that instead, and you can compare that to Kim Kardashian now. Or J-Lo, 45-year-old woman on a cover of a magazine with no clothes on. Come on, man. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's a trip. Because it's inverted. And Imam Ibn Qayyim said that when people see the permissible as forbidden, and the forbidden as permissible, this is a sign of a spiritual psychosis. They have forgotten their very nature. So she said, Ya late, I wish I was dead before they will accuse me of something like that. Now, how do we carry ourselves at the convention, sis? Or bro? Do we have that effa? Shaitan comes and says, You ain't never gonna get married. Come on, man, put a little foundation here. Your foundation's here, girl. It ain't here. Come on, bro. Walk with a little swag. He made a mistake. We say Iman swag. Right? Carry yourself, man, come on, you can wear some bracelets, man, it's cute, man. You know, wear a little necklace here and a Allah, you know, Mr. T. Them <laughs> girls are like you, right? Where's the if as one of our young sisters from Boston told me, I love a brother who lowers his gaze. And the brother that has the nor of vicar is the one who appeals to me. And vice versa. So a sense of dignity, a sense of iffa. And we see that Islam encourages us, no, try it before you buy it. And unfortunately in our communities, the hardest thing to do is get married, and the easiest thing in any book of fiqh is marriage. And that's a curse that we have polluted the sharia. We've made it so difficult that now we see facade in our community because we make it easier to climb Mount Everest in some sandals than getting married in our community. And let's not even talk about the converts. The other thing that they came to protect was the honor of people. There should be no Jim Crow policy in Islam. There should be, no one should be looked down upon. There should be humility. And that's why when Christ came from his mother as a baby, he talked. Now all of us have accomplished things. All of us have done incredible things in our life that cause us at times to become self-inebriated. We forget who we are. And that leads to oppression and, 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 and wrongdoing, the Fir'aunic personality. And when he came from his mother, can you imagine if you walked up in the hospital and this baby was like spitting? I'm saying like Cornell West, saying like nefarious instead of bad. Just you know, dropping it. And not only that, he knew the Torah up and down. He was a Hafiz. 
and he had his galibs and he had everything rocking and it's a baby you would say this baby has a right to be a little proud 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 you know have a little pride but what did he say when he came out of his mother's loins and the people started to accuse his mother of an evil crime he said inni abdullah the first thing that christ said when he was born and he spoke as a child is I am the servant of God. Why? To maintain humility. Because a humble person will not oppress others. A humble person will not dishonor others. So we learn how to gauge success. And finally, property. The property should be preserved. Now, we don't have much time now. I think my 15 minutes is over, um, to be real. But I want to touch on a few points quickly about the story. But I thought it was important to show how Sharia, this incredible Sharia that we're talking about, how that doesn't bleed back through, but gnaws back through all of the other prophets, and you find the Sharia in their life. So for a Christian to say, I want to ban Sharia, you want to ban Christ. For a Muslim to say, or a Christian to say, I want to ban you know, Sharia, a Jew to say that, you would ban the Torah. Because we'll find many of the similar objectives in the same text. But the story starts with a woman. And that's what's incredible about the story of Musa. That if you look at the story of Moses, the entire story is about incredible women. His mom, his sister, his wife, the wife of Pharaoh. The wife of Pharaoh was so entranced with God. Now when we get married, the first thing we hear is, I want a house. I can relate. I want a house too. But she, Rabbi binili indaka baytan fil jannah. She said, I want, and here in Arabic actually it doesn't work. If you're good in Arabic, you're like, why is the dharf coming before, you know, the actual object of the supplication? It's very strange. She didn't say, oh my Lord, I want a house in paradise close to you. She said, oh my Lord, close to you I want a house in paradise. Because as one of our mashaykh said, for her to be in paradise and be far away from Allah would be hell. So the qurba comes before the na'mah. So being near to God is more important to her than even her own pleasure. So she sacrificed in this life and she sacrificed in the next. I'm sorry to hit on your story. But that takes us to the life of Christ. And this incredible example of women. I mean, the prophet, when he made hijra, we never talk about how a woman, uh, he climbed on her back to go over a fence in Mecca. This is reached to us with a sanad, which is sahih from Imam al-Bayhaqi, that the prophet, she, he couldn't get out of Mecca. I mean, after he left the house, what happened? Being he was in a cave? Yeah, ask yourself what happened. He couldn't get out. The walls were there. A woman, she got on her all fours and said, climb my back, ya Rasulullah. I had the sanad of sahih. Because I know where it's going to head now. How could he, you know, But this story is about also incredible women and men. And one of them was the mother of Mary, who supplicated to God for a child. And Allah says about him, that the family of Isa, because as Muslims we learn a quick lesson, nothing happens in a vacuum. The Mehdi syndrome doesn't work, yo. I'm not going to join him and say, well, I'm just waiting for the Mehdi to come. Get out of here. You know, I'm going to be righteous when Imam Mehdi comes. One of our scholars said, if you have that attitude, when Imam Mehdi comes, you better run. Because he's going to be looking for you. So first and foremost... It didn't happen out of a vacuum. These were righteous people. These were a righteous group of people. And that's why it's important for us, even before we're married, to be righteous. A taqwa has jamal to it. Has a nur to it. And that's why the prophets constantly thought ahead and said, Dhurriyat, Dhurriyat, Dhurriyat. Not only my aqarib, my close family, but my distant relatives as well. Yesterday, a woman from Uzbekistan became Muslim in Roxbury, and she said, my ancestors were Muslims, but we left Islam. And I said, but their supplication came back to you. So that outward 
concept of having ufuq. So Christ doesn't come out of a vacuum. Christ comes out ذُرِّيَّةً بَعْضُهَا مِنْ بَعْضُ بَعْضُهَا مِنْ بَعْضُ means that they were, as we understand it, helpers of each other or cooperative towards righteousness. And we believe that cooperation towards righteousness is one of the fundamental principles of Sharia, no matter who it's with. And that's why Allah says, وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْسَبْرِ and Allah says, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ Which means help all of you, Muslim, non-Muslim, whatever you are, towards goodness and not towards evil. And this is the same advice that Luqman gave us to his son that's found in Surah Asr. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا يَا بُنَيَّ لَا تُشْكِكْ بِلَهِ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّارِحَاتِ أَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَأْمُرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ And here in And what's the last? وَتَوَاصَوْا بِي وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا أَصَابَكَ إِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنْ أَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ So we find a continuum. So the family of Christ did not just pop up one day, Harry Potter style. Bing! Oh, righteous people. There was work. Allah says, goodness brings goodness. You will know the tree by its fruit. So his grandmother was praying for a son. She was granted a daughter. And Allah says, فَلَمَّا وَضَعَتْهَا قَالَتْ رَبِّ إِنِّي وَضَعَتُهَا أُنثَا And when the mother of Mary realized that she had this daughter, she said, oh, I had a daughter. And here we have two qira'at. وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا وَضَعَتْ This is Hafs, this is the qira'a of America now. And if you read it that way, then it's Allah who's speaking. And Allah knows best what she gave birth to. But the khira of Shu'bah and Asim, another reading of the Quran, which is also authentic. Wallahu a'lamu bima wada'tu. Which means, God knows best what I gave birth to. And we understand from that khira that it's the mother of Mary who's talking. And here the scholar said, this is the adab that the believer should have with Allah. When things don't necessarily go how you plan, you say, you know what? Allah knows best. And the next part of the verse, وَلَيْسَ الذَّكَرُ كَالْأُنثَى And here we need to explain something in only three minutes. And that is, that this means, and men and women are not the same. Some people held that, oh, this means that Islam like says girls, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's like patriarchy. But according to the strong riwayah of the Qur'an, وَلَيْسَ الذَّكَرُ كَالْأُنثَى is the statement of Allah. As if to say, this girl that you're giving birth to is incredible. This girl that you have been blessed with is something else, is something special. And that's why later on it says, أَنْبَتَهَا نَبَاتًا hasan." Wallahi, it's hard to translate this. It means, you know, like, Nabt is a seed that grows. So Allah describes the growth of Maryam as though God took it upon himself to raise her and nurture her just like you see the vegetation grow and become right and perfect and win the blue ribbon. This is how Allah took care of Maryam. And that's why the Prophet said, Adabani Rabbi fa'ahsana tatiba. That Allah taught me how to be as a person. And then we know she gave birth to this young boy later on, Maryam who was going to be her son, Isa, Christ. But before that, the dua again, one of the themes of this story, if you pay attention, is supplication. So it begins with a supplication. In the middle, إِنِّي سَمَّيْتُهَا مَرِيمُ إِنِّي عِيذُهَا بِكَ وَذُرِّيَّتَهَا مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ She makes dua for her children and for Mary. And then Zakaria comes to her, the father of John the Baptist, and sees that Wow, she وَجَدَ عِنْدَهَا رِزْقَ قَالَ يَا مَرْيَمُ أَنَّ لَكِ هَذَا He sees that Maryam in Palestine, she was rocking mangoes, yo. And like watermelons. Fruit like, you know, pineapples and stuff. And full of steam in the winter? What's that? Oh, it's a pineapple. Even Kathir said that in Abida wa Nihaya, that every fruit that Maryam had would have won like the blue ribbon. So he was shocked. He said, where did you get that from? She said, huwa min indila from Allah. And immediately when he sees that, he has an iman boost. Hunarika da'a zakariya rabbah. And immediately he makes dua. And the ulama, and here you have to watch this because we don't have any time now. 
but this is dope. I mean, excuse me, aunties, this is really good. And that is, that is, that we know that Zachariah, his wife, was what? Wamra'ati Aqir, was barren. She couldn't give birth to children. So when he saw that Maryam, God had given her fruits out of season, he realized if God has the power to give my, this niece of mine fruits out of season, he can give my wife a child out of season, and he made dua. And he was blessed with John the Baptist. Now, as I finish the story in 30 seconds, she gave birth to an important child. His name is Esau. And there are some fundamental beliefs we have about him that I'll share really quickly. And I apologize to the time sister. May Allah bless you. You're doing a great job. Because I see you. Number one is we believe that he had no father. That his creation with God was like the creation of Adam. Number two, we believe that he's one of the greatest prophets, Ulul Azam in Islam. Number three, we believe that he gave glad tidings of Muhammad. As mentioned in the Quran. Number four, we believe that he taught absolute tawheed. It says in the fifth chapter of the Quran, whoever associates partners with God and the voice of Isa on his words quoting him, they will not enter paradise. And God says in the Quran, وَلَا تَقُولُوا ثَلَاثَ إِنْتَهُوا خَيْرًا لَكُمْ إِنَّمَا إِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهُ وَاحِدٌ In the fourth chapter of the Quran, it says leave off saying that God is one of three, he's only one. We believe also that he wasn't killed, but it was his likeness. As mentioned in the Quran, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ The last is we believe he will, he will return. وَإِنَّهُ عِلْمُ السَّاعَةِ فَلَا تَمْتَرُنَّ بِهَا وَاتَّبِعُونَ In the 43rd chapter of the Quran, he says that Jesus is a sign for the last hour. And I want to clear something up quickly as we finish. And this is for the Muslimin. The idea that Jesus returning is somehow not supported by strong text. The Shaykh of our Shaykh in Hadith, Shaykh Al-Ghumari, Rahimahullah, Ibn Siddiq, he has a book where he took all the Asanid of the Hadith, those prophetic traditions that prophesy the return of Isa. Out of them, 13 reached the status of Tawatur. 13 reached the status of where it would be impossible to entertain the idea that it was a fabrication, as mentioned by Imam Ibn Hajar in Fatul Bari. As I finish, just some quick lessons that I touched on and I'm done. Number one, the relationship of the prophets and Sharia. These five important objectives of Sharia, which they're, I'm sure they're going to be talking about this great condition. My first time to be Ikhn, I'm very happy to be here. Number two, number two is that the prophets were brothers. Their fundamentals, belief in God and the hereafter and the angels and the books and the messengers, is the same, although they might have differed on certain things that were permissible during their times. Number three, we said the story starts with incredible women, and this is the pattern we find often in the Quran that women and men are involved, right, at all levels. So we find the Prophet in the early days of his seerah involved a slave, a youth, a woman, and a rich man, because that was everyone who represented different socio realities of his society. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then we talked about some of the beauty, because we don't have much time, really, of we could continue, and he could continue. I'm sure he's going to do a much better job than me, because his YouTube videos are off the chain. <laughs> MashaAllah. But the, the incredible beauty behind the Quranic expression, right? How you can just keep abstracting and abstract, uh, extracting lessons after lessons. As Abu Hanifa said, the stories of the righteous are more beloved to me than fiqh. Because in the stories of the righteous is the reality of fiqh. Is the reality of Islamic law. And finally, we mentioned the points about Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu salam, those five beliefs about him. Thank you for your time. I apologize for going over a little over. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.